almost feels i i think it's it comes from you know doing when you are doing you are putting into the world good you know you feel that you're putting good into the world that what you're doing you are you're you're putting in something that you you feel has meaning and has a, a kind of charge you know and i think um you you know you know you know i mean i mean in in any art form i think you know when something sort of just seems to be kind of packed with meaning and kind of significance and when you when you get it right you don't always get there then it feels like that's when you feel like, i think you you feel like you're following the righteous path you feel like you have you have channeled something that seems sort of not of this world then then we're really then we're on the righteous path you know and and you know you i think you get that i think that's you know that that's what music is it's sort of not of this world it's sort of it's like a i don't know and sort of architecture in another dimension or or, or something you know wow Wow. Yeah. You know, just, just when, when you, when you first um, mentioned those words to me, uh, uh, I got, I had goosebumps. Okay. <laughs> Always on the ship. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, I remember that conversation. Breakfast, and yeah. I, I, I didn't, I, well, I didn't have that, that context that you just explained even in like a minute. Um, yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I mean, and that's, uh, I hate to say it, but that's what, what I'm all about, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's no there's no reason for me to actually um, claim that I'm an artist if I'm not if I'm not changing the things around me. And like I mean that, like literally, when I'm playing with a band and I play a note, even though some people may say it's like egotistical or something. But well, I want if if I play a note, I want that note to have an impact. And and it's it's really it's really interesting because for for some people it's it's sort of difficult to understand and and I guess that there are sort of like um, well you've you've been in different roles and different kinds of bands you know like I know you mostly as a band leader but um, yeah um, but I I find like even even if in a sideman position you do want to you do want to change the the whole to be better right yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. Um, I, I suppose, I suppose a lot of us have just sort of reflecting on just you know, what it is you do. I mean, I mean, if anything, you know, um, one thing about the last year of not being not being out and around people is that it, it's not. I've I've never really given that much thought to to what it is that we do. We've sort of just done it, but it's now it's sort of been thinking a lot more about uh, about what it, what it is that we do. And I've always been I'm I've always been happy in in as, as long as I'm into what's being made, I'm happy to be in any role, whether it's sort of sergeant major or whether it's just foot soldier. Mm -hmm. But even you know, but I kind of think that you know, kind of what I what I do, I've, I've got a, a a certain I suppose um, stink. Uh, you, you know, whenever I get involved with something, I bring a certain stink to it. It's mm -hmm. like you know, it's almost like if you. You, you put garlic into a meal you sort of know about it and i think if i'm involved in something then I, li I like to be able to bring my stink to it a bit and even if it's only in the role of the foot salt soldier the way the way you sort of well you know you you have a much smaller bandwidth of choices perhaps to make but then in a way it becomes more important to make those i'll just turn my heater on um, um, it becomes more important i think to make those choices wisely well so say if i was playing in um in, like, it was with, with cardiacs where really you know, you're, you're, you're playing sort of determined material but you do get to you you do get to to to, to rub your your own stink onto it a bit mm -hmm. you just want to sort of you, you want to sort of make sure it's the right one but then in the band leader role it, it's a different thing again but i love i love being able to be in 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 all the different roles because each time you bring a di you you bring a different part of yourself to it and then also the people that you're playing with you, you re the way you react to them, you, you bring a your new thing. And I think we're all looking for, we're trying to find that centre of the bullseye, trying to find this kind of, yeah, this thing that just seems to just vibrate with meaning and significance and, and importance. Mm -hmm. And you don't know where you're going to find it. And it's certainly not in any one genre of music. I think it's, and, and sometimes you could play with a, a real strange bunch of people, but you find, you find that thing and you know that you've been, but like you, you said, you know that you have brought, you have been able to, you know, bring yourself in. So I, I, I know what I'm looking for, kind of thing. So mm -hmm. if I'm in any situation, I'm not saying again, it's not the egotistical thing. But if I'm in any situation with a bunch of musicians, I can hear 
the sort of shape that's being made. I, I feel quite confident that I, I can I can access you know the portal uh, mm-hmm. th- through through whatever through whatever sort of um, through whatever sort of um, tools and kind of things are, are there. Does that? You know, yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, I, I remember these jokes about Rick Rubin, uh, like as a producer. So he just kind of visits the studio, like uh, at the beginning of the session and at the end, yeah. right? And uh, uh, but I I believe that like the the vibe of a person, the way that somebody instructs other people, um, also kind of has a big influence in the in the field of the arts and in music. So I yeah. I I find like well you know I, I experienced it myself so maybe like my my part is extremely low in the mix where i know other people don't hear it right or they are not diff- not able to tell what it is that i contribute but if i mute that part in the mix it's still it it, it makes a huge difference yeah, like you yeah. know what i mean so so it's like it's like this this function of glue that some that we have as artists, which is kind of like attached on top of the texture of the note somehow. So, yeah. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> so it's something that grows out of the, the bullet that is the note and and kind of like, you know, it connects like uh, like Velcro somehow. Yeah, you know? <laughs> the bullet that is the note, this is nice. <laughs> 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 yeah got a bit of dust on the screen which is right over your cheek i'm just gonna... there we go. Uh, okay well that, like that's, a, that's that's that was like that was an affectionate thing you know like <laughs> like if we were having a meal together because you're so it was so close it was like if i took a bit of lint off your um yeah if I took a bit of lint off my glasses off yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah no fantastic you, you know my my idea uh with these conversations is basically i have no idea but um, I try to go further, you know, than I, I, I try to start at the end of the conversation that I think we could have had. Yeah. Okay. And and want to go like where we really don't know what you're talking about, but like so. Um, so I, I I know a little bit about you, but not very much. And. Um, mm-hmm. You you strike me as like very much, uh, and you 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 correct me. You tell me if I'm wrong. You could uh, you strike me as sort of like a natural performer, or like like you have a certain, like for lack of a better term, organicness about how you interact with the audience and with the instrument. Okay. That yeah. for me, it's it's difficult to tell if, for example, if you practice your guitar and how you mm-hmm. practice it. Like this is something that I'm inter- interested in because with the touch instrument I play, there hasn't been any tradition of playing it. So I had to yeah. kind of focus on that part of it. But with your playing, it seems so natural and and it seems in a way effortless, but at the same time, it also looks as if you're struggling. It's kind of interesting. It's like this, <laughs> it's and and so so how what what's the reality? Like how how did this whole uh, thing with music happen to you and in how far was practice involved? Um, okay, well, um, okay, that's a good question. I mean, it came to me. I'd, I had al- I had always liked music. Uh, I'm, I'd always apparently, you know, been drawn to it. And I, I remember writing songs in my head when I was very young. Uh, but we didn't have any musicians in the family. We weren't really around music. As it turns out, my grandparents um, were musicians, and my uncle, but my my mum wasn't, and my dad. You know, they weren't even really interested in music. It wasn't music on, but so it's so always really obsessed with, you know, these um, TV themes. So mm-hmm. he used to listen to that because that was the, one of the only ways that music came into the house. Um, and then we got a piano and I sort of was making song to just really rubbish tunes up on that. And then then what re- the real epiphany was in 1980, I was eight years old, um, sort of pop music, getting into pop music and seeing um, the Stray Cats on top of the pops Mm -hmm. and then that was just like kind of you know almost just just everything went funny and changed and it's just i knew what i had to be i knew that was and that was really from that point onwards from being eight years old all i all i wanted to do was be in a band and front a band and play guitar or well really just play guitar the fronting the band came later actually more out of necessity Mm -hmm. but um i just really wanted to play the guitar so you know, throughout my teens, I got an electric guitar, a really rubbish one when I was about 11. 
um and then you know just put i but i in terms of practicing i never i never really used to work out kind of tunes i might work out a riff or something but mm -hmm. i was kind of more into trying to write my own stuff and i sort of taught myself so i've got a lot of bad habits but i i went in kind of writing stuff um mm -hmm. And then we would do, you know, later on my school band, you know, put school band together. We do do like a, a cover version, like an Iron Maiden tune or something. But I was always more into kind of writing my own thing. Um, and then when I left school when I was 16, I sort of put together kind of a, a more proper kind of metally band with with older guys, um, some older guys. And, um, you know, and, and trying to do that kind of, I suppose, kind of, initially kind of when i was about 16 that sort of was the time that kind of things like metallica had just put out and justice for all and i was into that kind of kind of right hand but then i had my real big epiphany with music which started with sort of cardiacs and voivod um and then that everything changed and then i went through this sort of funny phase between about i suppose um between about being around 17 to 21, around that 17 to 21, when I moved to London, where I, I feel like um, it was just like a re, my, you know, resetting of everything. And I changed the way I played guitar. Um, and there was, you know, a sort of, I had this whole thing, it's, it's like, it started off with Cardiacs, which I just couldn't believe uh, that music like that existed. And then because of that, that led on to things like, um, you know, Henry Cow, um and Zappa and Beefheart and Sid Barrett and John Zorn and one one aspect of King Crimson, particularly Robert Fripp's guitar playing, was incredibly in, had a profound impact on me on that time. And then I left home and sort of started taking LSD, and all that kind of all these sort of elements started co really coming together. Sort of with a, sort of like the, what the music that was going on at the time and cardiacs. This is around sort of 1991, and then sort of listening to this stuff like and also like sort of Stravinsky as well. But things like particularly the song you know, Fracture, which is sort of obsessed with Fracture, and um, and did and the like XDC as well. And then all the, all certain things started really like etching themselves in, and this became like my real starting point. Mm -hmm. um, and so from then on, I kind of sort of developed a style out of that kind of those really like intense years of doing that and i had a friend my best friend dan chudley was going through exactly the same experience in in, in the band and we formed a, a band together called the monsoon bassoon sort of moved to london and did that band and that became very much from the sort of starting point of um i guess like fr the frip and baloo kind of thing but also like the kind of magic band kind of style of guitar playing with really colliding part mm -hmm. and also sort of like the sonic youth way of doing things so we're really really into steve reich as well so we sort of between the two of us just developed this kind of style and kind of just practiced just used to play together a lot so in terms of practicing it was more and, and when, when i left home we went on i went on the dull like sort of welfare kind of thing and the way i thought about it, it was like i just want to be all i want to do is just play music you know, this is all I've wanted to do now. I just couldn't wait to leave home and leave school. And all my band, we were all on the doll. And then my band, the Monsoons, were. So that's that's how we were able to move to London. And we, we just basically used to spend, certainly me and Dan, just all day, just, you know, mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. this stuff. And every couple of weeks, sort of dropping acid and just writing, just playing these kind of funny, you know, you were just, like I said, the starting point was like sort of discipline and, you know, elephant talk and frame by frame, that sort of style of playing. But also then Steve Rice was, was was that kind of thing and getting more and more into playing one meter against the other one. And then on top of that, then putting singing on top. Mm -hmm. So we'd have the two of us doing this kind of these these two cycles and then really getting into the kind of the Lydian mode of doing things, which just seemed to sort of buzz with more magic than anything else. <laughs> and then that was really my and then that was really everything I've done since has sort of came from those really intense you know five or six years in my early 20s where i just sort of dedicated everything to to sort of developing this style and what was weird is that when dan moved back to um the southwest in plymouth where we, we grew up i sort of found myself on my own and i had this sort of half one half of a style i was so used to doing everything with this other player 
where we would we but that I I kind of then had to become a different musician again. You know, I had mm-hmm. to teach myself to be more a, a sort of more rounded player in a way, and and got and got more into sort of writing for that's how Knife World happened. Got more into writing for writing yeah, it, for a large ensemble kind of thing. Interesting, but that's that's like a I find an interesting story where you kind of like grow up grew up practicing playing with a partner. Yeah. And then that partner goes away and what remains is this probably like more abstract way of playing because yeah, there's yeah. there's the you know the other half the other hand is missing, right? And you get you get this um and this is very interesting because I I believe I can still hear that level of abstraction in in how you arrange and how you make the right, okay. you know what I mean? Like and I, I hear what you mean in terms of like becoming a more rounded player, but uh, um, yeah, okay. But tell me, what do you mean by that? Like well-rounded. Well, I mean, well, there, there was a number of reasons I became a more rounded player. I mean, one of them was was joining Cardiacs because that was a style that I'd never, I hadn't really played in. That well, I mean, you know, you've. I, I mean, if you think about where we both ended up, the kind of people that we played with. Um, mm-hmm. And to to have someone who who I just thought was with, with Tim Smith, you know, I mean, his his music had such a profound impact on me when I was sixteen and I first heard them in in 1988, and then to move to London and become friends with the guy, which was just amazing, you know, it was sort of so close kind of thing, and then to, to join the band and play that stuff, and it was kind of it was, it was so in my DNA. But mm-hmm. it was it was definitely it was it it fitted in with my style. I mean, there are not too many bands I I could play in. I mean, it, I I could I could play it, but it really it, it again I again it was a lot more chordy. Whereas mm-hmm. with Monster mm-hmm. Assumes, the soon stuff, it would be chordy, but it would also be these these kind of long lines, kind of thing. Um, with with Cardiacs, it was it, it was actually the role was a bit more traditional. It was like rhythm and lead kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, but with this extra this this extraordinary music. And then yeah. I think again, sort of then joining Guapo. I mean, each, I mean, I mean, you you must find this that each time you join a different ensemble, it it requires you to you know it what you what you do maps onto it, but maybe not completely. So it requires you to get some more to 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 find a few new things that. So each time I think just generally playing with other people that was the other thing because that being in that band the Monsoon Bassoon was kind of like a cult. We were just you know just living this band day in day out. But I think once the band split up, and I, and I thought that was the band we were going to get, you know, I was just going to spend the rest of my life with. And so that when when we split up, because because honestly, it was just that band had such a good chemistry to it, it was incredible. But when we split up, it kind of I sort of found myself well, I don't have a plan. I thought that I was just going to be doing that band. So then I kind of I, I I kind of loosened up as to to what I wanted to do. So when Tim asked me to join Cardiacs, it was like, well, yeah, yeah, great, I'm, yeah, I'd love to do it. Whereas I think had he asked me four or five years earlier, I would have said no because I've just just wanted to con- just only wanted to concentrate on my band. So I think that was the thing. It, it, it with the, with that band splitting up, it really freed me up to kind of do things that I wanted to do, you know, and things that I felt kind of that I could bring something to. So Guapo was one of them, you know. And yeah. So you... when we first met, wasn't it at a Guapo show? Yes. Yeah. We were um, through Dan I, Chin. Yeah, I I can't remember which year that was. Two. Th- 16 maybe 2016 or something okay yeah it was, it's not not that not that long ago no it, it seems like ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe uh yeah um so you you know like this this uh split of your first band probably really served uh, uh you know the very purpose of freeing you up yeah. being cardiacs right yeah, 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 incredible. And I mean, the music of cars. You said you discovered them when you were sixteen, so you did not have to learn the mindset. You did not have to learn the vibe. No, that no, was no, that no. was all available to you. So, so on top yeah. of that, I was working from guitar tech. I mean, I, I can't guitar tech, but just Tim just got me along because you know he likes to have his friends around. So I was guitar tech for <laughs> seven or eight years before I joined. So I was already part of the, you know, I'd, I'd been seen yeah. all the gigs at the side stage. I knew that I knew how it all worked, you know, mm-hmm. sorry, carry on. No, 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 no. Amazing. I mean, I, I, it's just like this point that I, I believe like in order to join cardiacs and like 
other bands for that matter, you really kind of like have to have some sort of intuitive understanding of what the music is sort of about in order to, in order to be able to contribute the right, uh, like going back to the beginning of the conversation, the right bullet, right? Yeah, like the, yeah, the yeah. right, you know, right surface texture of, of what you, the right stink. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that because I, for myself, I feel like I'm such a late, uh, yeah, I've started so late somehow. And um, I'm still, still wondering if I had, you know, what would have happened if I had understood much earlier in my life that music was what I was supposed to be doing. And, you know, like I, I was really, um, uh, it took me, took me a long time. It was, I was, 38 so 36 or something when wow. i when i realized i wanted to really uh, go for it you know so before it was always just like a hobby i mean which i i did it sort of like professionally which is interesting but i was still considering what i did uh, do as a hobby and i had this this little company to earn money so that i can could do my art and i never expected to actually make any money with music and yeah. and and it's still not about making making money with music but um right now it's it's something that is even though we have covid the covid years it seems it seems like i'm not getting off that path so easily yeah, yeah same <laughs> yeah exactly the same yeah. I, I mean it took me years to it took me years to make any money at all out of it i mean all the time i was doing monsoons i mean i always had a it, until really until about two or three years ago i always had a a day job as well you yeah know, yeah a, a job where i'm able to you know you're able to just you know drop it at the whenever music work comes up may, uh, may i ask you what you what were you doing for a day job yeah sure i'm a painter painter and decorator decorating <laughs> just got into and, and i love it you know I, yeah. well, I say i love it i certainly um it certainly leaves your mind free to concentrate yeah. on music i mean there were the last knife world record I remember, and it's this is the great thing about with an iPhone is that I, I remember writing the horn part, for the horn arrangement for a song called "A Dream About a Dream." I wrote the horn part at the top of a ladder on a stairwell, painting a just painting a, a, the, the ceiling of a stairwell up this ladder mm -hmm. on my own, and just he, hearing the just going through, and having the whole day just to go through the parts because I don't know that it's the left right brain thing, but you can always be arranging and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then getting my iPhone out and going, okay, here's the here's the low part, singing the parts in, and so I was kind of you're able to sort of work and decorate, and also it, you're not working for you don't have a boss, you don't have to, you're not working you're working for the client, mm -hmm. you're working for the client. The arrangement is really good and upfront. They trust you enough to let you be in their house, and then your then your your only business is with the job, and it's such a kind of you know, I'm pretty good at it and I can work pretty quickly. And so but you, the, the part of your mind that deals with that is not the part of your mind that's dealing with processing all these kind of psychedelic <laughs> thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. of, and the ideas and arrangement and just that, that kind of abstract other dimension stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, and you, and you don't leave work feeling resentful. I mean, I've had a job, you know, jobs before where you have to work for people and you just sort of come out of work feeling really angry and... <laughs> I don't mm. want to be feeling like this mm. isn't this isn't you know how I want to be feeling so so actually that was fine I really really enjoyed you know having that as a job and I was my own boss worked on my own and of course then any music work that comes up you, you can fit it around it and once I'd earned enough money for that month's rent I just wouldn't work anymore I didn't just go and work on making music and stuff so you sort of just earn enough just to get by but but yeah the COVID hasn't changed it hasn't changed any of that at all no I mean yeah, I mean, less opportunities to play shows for sure, but uh, yeah. yeah, but you know, for um, I mean, f f for me, I have to say it was a significant cut, um, really was, um, because of like Tony Levin being kind of like famous, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we 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 know or we, we knew that we could play say fifty to eighty shows every year, every yeah, single year, yeah. but. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, like in, in a way, um, um, and I find I find this fascinating because you 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 know you were 
doing that, you know, that painting job and you were, were free to, and this is where I think the practicing that I was talking about was not necessarily talking about you practicing your instrument or it was like just, just the overall idea of you honing your skills. And when you're telling me this, just like casually that you're arranging the horn parts, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like I said, like you, you strike me as like really a, a super, uh, natural naturally talented person uh with an Im imagination that is really extraordinary like like I, I it means obvious 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 from hearing the music okay so that's that's it's obvious there but you never know what the source is really like for me i would kind of like have to work stuff out on paper let's say like or yeah. i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't be uh satisfied with the ideas that my brain comes up with in the first place i would want to them to to go further and then i would i would look, like treat them and tweak them forever till they turn into something completely different but hearing like what you just described like like really having this vision for something complete in your head and then just just going for it singing it into your iphone it's it's that's incredible man and that's that's really what i what i what i what i um what i think like everybody has a chance to experience your your personality um on a stage but also in a private situation um like it's uh yeah it's just um yeah it's just incredible sorry sorry oh, thank you. <laughs> but that's very, just, that's, that's, that's very nice to hear though because you know i've been here stuck in uh with my with my family and driving them nuts and uh, so just, <laughs> it's, it's very nice to hear that it's like oh, but it's good. it's 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 kind of it's it's amazing i've i've I'm not running into people like you <laughs> um, <laughs> regularly, you know, like the last year it was actually Devin Townsend, which is unbelievable. That guy. Uh, well, I'd be very interested to know about what that was like playing for him because I, I really, I really, really um, uh, am a fan. And in fact, Tim Smith turned me on to Devin Townsend. I'd never heard of him before mm -hmm. um, uh, at all. I mean, I knew, I knew uh, that, you know, he had, uh, I didn't know specifically he, I knew, I remember the Steve Vai album coming mm -hmm. out that he was on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't get that one. I remember I got the first one and um, Passion and Warfare, but I didn't get that one. So I wasn't really aware of him. And then it was in the kind of, when would it have been? It was around the time, I, um, to early 2000s, that Tim did me a mini disc of the Strapping Young Lad album, City, mm -hmm. and then the Devin Townsend album, called uh physicist do you know this mm -hmm. record physicist? Mm -hmm. yeah and that, that both knocked my head off but i remember particularly this album physicist i just thought this is like a metal cardiac so this mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and again it's that lovely you know the lydian world that was just mm -hmm. pure magic for me mm -hmm. and there's that there was this one song at the end um of physicist called planet rain and it was from the, there's a cardiac track called dirty boy which just seems to be the absolute rock valhalla uh, kind of thing and um and planet rain al also had had this vibe it was just pure just like end of the world kind of apocalyptic ecstasy orgasm kind of a tune i just absolutely just thought it was so kind of audacious and brilliant so i really got on board the the devin townsend train at that point and in fact that was why um when Knife World signed with Inside Out, I thought, well, it's yeah, Devin Townsend's on that label, so you know, it's always, <laughs> just gonna be worth it. Sorry, because it's it's not really, you know, there's not much crossover with the kind of Inside yeah. Out bands, but um, but that was the that was my reason of thinking, oh well, look, that you know, that that'll be a good label to sign with. But no, I think he's brilliant. I mean, I, I, I've never met Devin, but I have friends who um, have, have you know met him and stuff, and I just I, I think yeah, I think he's exceptional, really. Yeah, and and really, he's. Um... It's kind of difficult to explain even, but um, he really seems, and I, I really had to experience that firsthand because like you hear the music and you, you kind of like realize, okay, there's something special here. There's this connection to something very universal that yeah, yeah. he's kind of like expressing. Um, but you never know if how that actually is represented in the person who makes that music. And um, it was great for me to see that he's like, everything that you, i would have hoped and much more than that like like he knows exactly what he wants he he like he hears the parts right 
like and he hears them he hears like it's it's really like i said it's so difficult to explain like it's like a certain kind of uh way of listening that he has where like i said you know some a part can be extremely low in the mix yeah. but it makes a difference and that's that's yeah. kind of like how he is with what he does yeah. like 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 everything everything is super important and 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 very uh um very much like represented in in his in his imaginary uh world in his mm. uh like uh, like the fantasy world this is yeah. also like a phrase that is on the empath album like this this fantasy world where he he kind of like has this super detailed picture of what he wants to do and it was funny when we got the band together let me get finish with it no, no, when we yeah. when we had the rehearsals and so he had basically uh met with each of us in the band individually and he'd shown us some parts but not n no not the overall not the whole arrangement or he just individual little details like little phrases we he wanted us to learn stuff like that but then when we came together there was like this um as it happens when you're a musician you kind of like you do have the idea you have ideas as well so you can kind of like you think okay this is something i could contribute and and i noticed very early on and i was very happy to notice that early he doesn't really he didn't need it he didn't need any suggestions from the musicians which was incredible like you know there were like i could tell that the the girls were younger you know they were maybe a little bit less experienced they tried a couple yeah. times to su suggest something yeah yeah <laughs> and and yeah. but but he was he was fantastic i mean like like he says that he's not a good leader or anything but he was so incredible in his communication with with us like he was he always said yes you know he said yes but implied no but yeah. in a way that that was just so so charming and so wonderful and so loving and and yeah. I and I think that's really what what you what the whole band that became about this 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 kind of like um, um, non non violent uh, communication somehow yeah. yeah 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 well I think that's I think that the the the, the, the two the couple of things you said is really interesting there and it's one about this kind of the the the, the fantasy world kind of thing that mm -hmm. kind of the 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 map of the territory that you've created inside and knowing i like you know i like it when something will surprise you there are certain things that you just hear and they don't belong in that world at all and so mm -hmm. get, the, get that thing out of you know it's <laughs> like a lovely old period piece and then you see a cgi some kind of cgi <laughs> monster get that thing out of but on, on the other hand you might come across an object and mm -hmm. go wow well i didn't know this was in here but this mm -hmm. this totally fits in here you know mm -hmm. this totally fits into this kind of sound sound well but the, also talking about devon as the band leader i mean this was for me a similar thing working with um tim smith is that you really learnt, or at least i learnt, how, or tried to learn at least i saw how to be this sort of hopefully the benevolent dictator because beforehand in our old band the monsoon bassoon i'd always it would be me it kind of been it was all of our band, but it was kind of me and Dan wrote and wrote the stuff. Mm -hmm. But we kind of worked on it together. It was with Knife World, it was much more about being a being in the di dictatorial role, but but also making it fun for everyone. And that's really one of the great things I learned with Cardiacs is that how Tim just made it such fun to be in that band because you do things his way, which mm -hmm. isn't to say that occasionally you might say, oh, you know, you'll get a you'll get a bit of a choice. And certainly when we when we were recording an album, then I could come up with my own parts, but when you're playing the kind of classic cardiac stuff, you play the stuff, and and you wouldn't want to change it, you know. Yep. But still, it's really, really, you know, if you if you believe in the music, and Tim just Tim just made it such good fun, and you're you're happy. I mean, I, I don't know if this is how you felt with with Devin, but you you are happy to serve yeah. this guy's vision because you believe you believe in that vision, you know. Exactly. And it's, and it's it's a nice thing to do to know that you're able to you're able to to be the person because. In your own band, that's the sort of people you want in your band, people that are going to serve your vision. So therefore, I'm very happy to serve someone else's if I'm really into it kind of thing. Exactly. And that's how I felt about it. But I have to admit that it felt because I wasn't used to being in, in that role. Right. Okay. At, at first, it just it just felt like, is this right? Like, is it is it right? Because I, I just didn't know that position really like i said i started late and then i was really stickman was the first real touring band i was in we started in, in early 2011 right so and 
and and and I I was like, if you're on stage with three three guys, then um, obviously like like as I said, like Tony's the star, and like you could see like the first three years I was in the band, like everybody was staring at Tony, yeah. and then like after the the fourth fifth year, maybe like a fourth of the audience occasionally looked over to my side, and then but but <laughs> now that I'm fully integrated in the band, it's it's like you know with three guys, everybody's a front man, right? In yeah. in a way, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and then like with Devin's band, just being in the second row, like literally also um, on stage. It was just so liberating and it was great. I felt it, it felt amazing. Like we, we, you know, we got cocktails. That was the first thing we did on stage before we even started playing. We went to the bar and got cocktails. And, uh, <laughs> and that was the whole setup of the, of the gig basically. And it was just so wonderful, but because it was so wonderful and I didn't have any of that responsibility being in the front, it also for a while made me wonder, is it, is this right it was interesting yeah. it was interesting it was like like i'd say like one of the greatest experiences of my life being in that band but at the same time i was wondering is this right and it was right right yeah but um yeah so there you go how many how many shows did you do i think it was about 25 or 28 or right, something okay. Yeah, and the last show, um, or the the show before the last, was at the Roundhouse, and that one was filmed and was recently put out. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was, I, I was, you got in touch, didn't you? I, I had something. I think I, that was when I was doing the Steve Hillage stuff. I think. Yeah, you had a gig. That, you said. That happened. Yeah, yeah. 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 Man, incredible, and and so um, let's just jump to the here and now okay so after this first year of covid and you having had like a couple releases this year and yeah. uh, you also did did uh, one or more than one uh, streaming show i yeah, i, yeah, I two, shows. Yeah, two, yeah. two um so how how do you feel about um what's 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 next um well i mean i've had quite a, i've had quite an interesting year I mean, uh, 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 just to, just to get you up to speed, yeah. um, we had um, I do this one group called the Utopia Strong, mm -hmm. which is uh, me and um, do you know about this band? Me, uh, yeah, with Steve, right? Steve Davis and yeah. Mike York, and yeah. th this is what all starts from improvisation, mm -hmm. and this has been a really really big deal getting into this band. Uh, do, you know, I, I mean, doing this band because it's a just completely starting from improvisation is brilliant and it's a whole different sort of vibe i'm playing sort of a lot of harmonium and just playing with playing with textures and things but again trying to bring my stink into it mm -hmm. as well not just being one of those sort of loop guitarists but to, trying to bring my own version of psychedelia into it and we all we all want the same thing in this band we're all trying to get the same thing and, and also again what i really like about it is in whereas all my life i've played with these different cycles of meters playing against each other with with the utopia strong we do it but they're not kind of they're not clocked in, mm -hmm. in a, in a, with a meter they're just one of us might make a strange cloud that takes you know a minute and a half to go around another one might make a strange cloud that takes 30 seconds to go around and so you get these really w weird orbits going along and then on and then playing on top of that and you know mm -hmm. mike is such a brilliant player as well and so that that's been really really good fun and because each show is improvised, we we ended up with making desk recordings and sometimes multi tracks, and ended up with some really really good stuff. So we we started putting out these limited edition two hundred and fifty copy LPs, mm -hmm. and I was doing lino cuts for the for the covers, and just thought that'd be a really nice thing. And as it happened with the with the COVID, that the the sales of those and my solo album, which I put out have sort of kept me afloat and record sales have never kept me afloat before really mm -hmm. so that, that kept me going over the mm -hmm. summer and then i've been writing a book where i finished this book but that's coming out in april um oh, i had no idea oh, well that was your medical grade music and I, I ended up right i wrote with me and steve again me and steve davis there's a funny story with that they because we we had our radio show where we would just be playing all kind of uh well we've played some of your music uh, on there, so we've played our crazy, but we sort of stopped that. But we had a oh, slow down. We 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 got given an offer to write a book to try and do a book version of our radio show, and initially it was going to be like us sort of 
recommending 52 albums by all these different artists that you may not know about. So it can be like Albert Marker and Yoshida Tatsuya and it's sort of like, um, you know, North City Radio Orchestra and Fred, you know, Ferdinand Richard and Fred Frith and just a whole load of albums that people wouldn't really know about. But I'm not really a music writer and for whatever reason, it ended up being more in sort of a part memoir and evangelising about music and sort of cuts between the two of us. So it ended up really being, for me, uh, writing about growing up in Plymouth and kind of what we were talking about earlier, my first two bands. I didn't read, and a little bit about Cardiacs, but it, it, there wasn't room to write about Knife World or Guapo or anything. I mean, I wrote about this stuff, but it didn't make the cut. So that's coming out in April next year. And so that was quite a good thing just to, you know, keep my mind active. But the, right, right now at the moment, I'm working on a second solo album. I'm just in working on a a tune which might be my best, my might be uh, maybe my favourite song I've ever written. I don't know. It's kind of like <laughs> a pop song. It's like about five minutes. It's quite mm -hmm. simple, but I just, I think I might have got it. And I'm 49 now, so I'm really happy that I, I turned 49 two or three weeks ago. And mm -hmm. I think, oh, I've got a 49, and I think I might, I think I might have cracked it. It's kind of a, a nice feeling. You know? Yeah, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> you know, it's nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> But then a couple of years later, you realize it was just another stepping stone. Yeah, always. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I, I wish I could remember the, um, there, there's a really, a friend of mine, really, really amazing character called Weasel Walter. Do you mm -hmm. know about this guy? No. He, um, he lives in um, sort of New York. He um, he used to be in a band called Flying Luttenbarkers. Actually, they've reformed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He sort of coined the term brutal prog. And the Flying Luttenbachers, I, I got hip to them because they'd done this really insane version of um, Magma's De Futura. Mm -hmm. And then I got to, and then we got, we started communicating because he's, um, uh, it was a Cardiacs fan. And now he plays in Lydia Lunch's band. And up until COVID, we'd, we'd run into each other. And if I was in New York, I'd see him. And he's, you know, the, it's really an intense, opinionated guy. And it's really interesting talking about music but i remember him saying that um everything you do it doesn't have to be the most well, well it's almost like the most extreme thing you can do it doesn't mean extreme in terms of being necessarily punishing or, or difficult but it everything you do you know you should make it the most you know whatever that thing is Mm -hmm. of it I, mean, I wish i could articulate this better which I'm, you know which is why probably i'm a musician and not a, really a writer <laughs> but i think that, that there's things where you you just go well that's the most that that this could possibly be and i've never done anything like that before and i think that that's one that's the philosophy i sort of apply to every single thing i do musically where i've i've got some creative input right from being right from the top down sort of thing and over the summer, we recorded a piece with the Utopia Strong. It's not mixed yet, but it's, it's, the recording is finished. And it, again, it was just one of those things where I think, wow, I, I never thought I would be involved in, a, in, in creating a piece of music like this. It just seems to, again, be the most, whatever that thing is, the most that that could possibly be. And it's a, it's a, it's a territory I haven't been into before. Whatever it is, it's really kind of sombre and kind of... It's eternal, sort of somber <laughs> and, it, and eternal. It's about 11 minutes long mm -hmm. and it just hangs around. And, and I played piano on it as well and some guitar. And it's just, you know, it's lovely to surprise yourself. And I think this is why it's so lovely to play with different uh, d different people and allow different things to happen is when you can still surprise yourself, you know, and, and get something and think, well, I don't know where that came from. I, don't, I wasn't expecting that to be the outcome. You know we're so we're so fortunate to be in a position where we don't have to uh we're not kind of like part of the normal marketplace right and we just yeah. we just do what we do and we can do what we want and just imagine like uh i don't know what the uh what keith richards must have felt like when he was 49. Yeah. like he he probably didn't have this kind of well, probably he did have that kind of feeling about the songs he was writing back then, but like certainly not in the sense of like the opinion of the audience, right? Where they were expecting the the hits or like the the older works and stuff. And like for me, it's it's 
I, I think it's just like an incredible, uh, it's, it's an incredible time we're living in it's, it's where it's possible to just be recognized for not repeating yourself, where you can be recognized for always changing or for, you know, even for, and I think this is, this is crucial, even for still being excited about the work or, you know, yourself about your work. And that, that excitement or the enthusiasm is something that the audience, that the listeners appreciate. And, yeah. and it's sort of, it's sort of as if you are your own, you know, not just the creator of the music, but also the, um, also the, um, the, 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 the worldwide press that is writing about your piece of music. You, you kind of like become that, I don't know, you become that, that huge speaker, right? That yeah. says, here, this is it. And I believe in it. I love it. And it's great. And like, like you were just describing these two new um, yeah. incredible pieces that you've been involved with, right? Yeah. Like it's, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a, <clears throat> I think this is where we're very lucky. This is where we're very, you know, here, here it comes, you know, the <clears throat> lucky not to be famous <laughs> or to be at this, uh, to be at, at, at certainly at a level where having done this now, I mean, I moved to London when I was 21 and, and I got my band Monsoons together. That's where it really started musically when I was about 22, 23. And there's a lot of people that still come to see me play and, um, well, not a lot, a few people still come to see me play and sort of buy my records that were there really early on, right at the beginning when I was playing in, in London, you know, when I was like 23 years old doing this stuff. But I, I sort of feel lucky that no one band ever really got successful, that people are like, oh, I wish he was doing, I wish he was still doing that again. You mean so many people who've wanted to move on from their successful band sort of ha either haven't really been allowed to or... The, the sort of ghost of this band like, hangs over them like a spectre. And I've never really had that. So I've been able to be, and, and again, this was never the plan. But when I look back now, now that I'm middle age, look back at just what I have done. And I think, oh, I've been really fortunate, for instance, to, to step aboard the Guapo, to step aboard the Guapo ship where they decided to expand from being at that point a three piece into a four piece. Mm -hmm. And then to, um, to be in this, you know, really funny band, a funny way of operating, but to be kind of writing and stuff, and do, and do that, was 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 really great. But we're, we're and 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 then to do, you know, to do Knife World, but never to be so big that by the time I joined Gong, that there was I felt like that, that I was responsible for the guys in Life World to give them a living or something, and there was no there was nobody in that band, so. Mm. I've been able to, and without ever dropping any project. So I can, I'm going to go back and do more knife work. I can go back. I, I can sort of flip between stuff, and not really feel like I've got any major fan base to disappoint by by mm -hmm. doing doing that. And I, I mean, a lot of people who know who only know me from Gong have no idea that I have a solo act. And a lot of people who know me from the Utopia Strong have no idea that I was in Cardiacs. And it sort of doesn't bother me really. It's not. I don't mm -hmm. need to make to sort of push this brand of me i quite like that i quite like you know being being able to just sort of flip between pick up things do another record there when i'm ready to do that then go and do this and oh here's a tour to do that right i'll go on tour and for a few weeks and then i'm in that band and but the only thing is when i whenever i'm doing any one thing i i like to only think about that thing i can't mm -hmm. so if i'm in gong world and i start getting emails about something else i tend to ignore them until i've actually got like you know a couple of days off or something. I don't. I can't engage with you. You have to keep to be a hundred percent about it. Whatever project you're involved with, I have to sort of like, you know, be be. Uh, be it, it's like being in. It's like maybe being in a a polyamorous relationship. Not that I ever have been, but you know, the <laughs> idea that when you're in a, you're in, what whoever you're with, you're giving them all your love. You know, each mm -hmm. band. I don't want to be doing. I don't want to be in the Utopia Strong world and then thinking about. Oh, what about my. What about doing some solo stuff? I just want to be okay. Just us three guys. We're ma we're making this music sort of thing. I I think it's easy if you're if you're about the music. You know, if what you do is about the music, then there's no question that whatever's happening here and now is the one thing I'm I'm totally associated with. You know, yeah. and um, yeah, but uh, in, interesting. You know, like, like for me, it's it's really. Um, 
it's it's uh, i i think that also like you said like okay so your level in, of involvement like 100 percent of attention and everything like but i think that even there like you can you could have varying uh varying uh attachment let's say like so because sometimes like when i when i produce somebody's record uh, and in the end, I'm basically just a project manager, right? Which well, okay. which happens, right? Yeah. But then, then obviously, I'm still doing a hundred percent of what I need to do. But the thing, like the 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 the, the ceiling, basically, is is somewhere else, though, because I'm not yeah. the responsible uh, artist, or you know. So I, I I find it interesting also sometimes to. To have these, especially since I I also do uh, um, solo performances, live performances, where really I don't even want to feel like I'm I'm responsible, even for that music. Like even yes, like when I perform, I'm a hundred percent there, or maybe even like hundred and ten percent, as people say, yeah, right, yeah. or something. But but really, I'm I'm just hundred percent there. But I have no emotional attachment, which is kind of interesting sometimes to what I do in the moment. And I find that when I manage, when I manage to not kind of like when my emotions don't interfere with the creation, with the pure doing of playing, right? Then, yeah. then uh, it it clearly shows also then in how uh, interested I am in listening back to the recording. So sometimes it happens to me that I I, I play a show and and it becomes my favorite album for a few yeah. weeks. And I listen to it every day. Right, you know exactly what I mean, right? And and but and that usually kind of like happens when, when the emotional attachment is kind of casual, you know, when it's yeah. when it's not necessarily that uh, love of a lifetime, but just yeah. that. Yeah. And and so with the solo shows you do, are these improvised? Yes. This is this is the exactly this is the new thing that the new itch thing that having. The Utopia Strong, which is a purely improvised thing, mm -hmm. exactly the, as you've just said. I, and I wouldn't be able to relate to this um, maybe two or three years ago, but since we've been doing these improvised um, sets, you know, particularly at, at gigs, you know, we'll do gigs and you'll come up and you think, Meh, that, yeah, that was all right. And then the following day in the car, we'd listen back to the recording. It's like, <laughs> bloody hell. Oh God, yes, and it's exactly. 10 minutes here and it's, you listen back and it's like, this is ridiculous ridiculously far out yeah. this is so beautiful and for this 10 minutes a curtain has been drawn mm. onto a vista an alien vista that you have never seen before mm. with the most extraordinary geometric architecture that seems to go on for miles and has this colors of sky that you've never seen before <laughs> and while you were making that music you weren't aware that you were revealing such a vista and I wasn't. If all you're trying to, all you're sort of trying to do as well is, is what I'm doing all right? Is this boring? Is it okay? Am I overplaying? All these micro decisions you're making. Hang on a minute. Have I played that bit for too long? And yet, when you hear it back, you just think every single note I chose to play is just sparkling with like some radiance. But no, you're exactly right. And you just think, how did we? How, the, how did we fucking this, man? You know. And that does become your favourite stuff because there's. Because a there's no expectation, but I think b because it's just some you are you know and, and here's a funny thing I I started believing in through music really started believing in as someone who's a real rationalist and I even am avoiding saying it by putting these I started believing in magic um, mm -hmm. not long ago you know three or four years ago or at least I started just calling music magic and going mm -hmm. music is magic mm -hmm. that, that that's what it is that's and once you know, because you're you're always well. I find I'm so in interested with the idea of consciousness and the existential and the metaphysical world. Of what music? What is music exactly? How come it can have this sort of profound effect that feels you know it's it, it's like supernatural? What? How can it be this supernatural thing in this kind of rational world? And as soon as I thought it's magic, that's what it is. And th then it kind of then it explained everything because I've had I've had times as well where. I've been sort of dicking around and I've I've almost come up with a song in the space of time it takes me to, to play it and with the melody as well, records and melody and go, well, where, that, that didn't come from anywhere. It didn't, that wasn't based on a riff that I've been playing around with for a few weeks. 
mm-hmm. this whole thing just came out of absolutely nowhere. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, well, it's magic. And then it was like, oh, well, that's all right then, it's magic. <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly. Like improvising that, well, it's, it's magic. Yeah, I mean, I would say, of course, it's magic. <laughs> it's what it is. Like, yeah, like, a long time to, uh... yeah. <laughs> so, so this is interesting for me. For me, that was always, I'd say, always obvious. You know, the yeah, that music is magic, and music is is really the fabric that the world is made of. There, yeah, right, yeah. and yeah, and. Yeah. Um, just like going a little personal here so with my with my teaching that i do where i where i do um focus a lot on getting people to actually do something or even anything meaning you know practicing right yeah there's like this this um this metaphor parable that i use to explain magic is like um so what how can you how can you actually practice yeah what can you do how can you practice magic like practice musical magic right yeah. and there's there's actually there's actually an answer that I've come up with which I kind of find find interesting and you can tell me if you think I'm stupid but so this 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 story is um that if you if you just imagine like like a stage magician who is who is doing something so the moment where you where you believe that magic is happening is where something happens that you're not expecting where you could say like in a, like in, from a sensual standpoint it doesn't make sense like there is no there's no um, um it just doesn't make sense that there should be a, a, a rabbit in the hat, right? Because like before, he's shown you and there's no, there's no rabbit in the hat. So, so basically, what the magician does, the magician, magician practices to create something, well, that is called like an illusion, I know, but I want to put it differently, create something that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So now, if we are musicians, and we want to practice to become make you know, makers of musical magic we need to practice on our instruments things that do not make sense that yeah. do not make sense musically so that's why i'm hardly I'm, I'm not teaching people to play songs no i'm 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 you know teaching them to play uh dexterity finger exercises permutations it's, you know things that don't make sense in a musical world so that when you're actually exposed to the musical impulse, let's say, to the creative impulse, when, when you're being asked to perform, you think is really don't know what to do and they do anything and the anything becomes something magical. And, yeah. and, and that's, that's, that's really, um, yeah. I like this. This is, this is, this is brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely. And I also like, the, the rabbit out the hat analogy as well because it, it's that moment of just what, you know, what what just happened then you know and it, it's it's trying to get that feeling but also I mean as well with music whatever it is and I, I, I've said this before maybe even, even to you but I, I will say that we have this sort of really limited bandwidth mm-hmm. and with it within that you know within that bandwidth through the organization of of notes and things. It, it it seems to sort of go in on a on a on a on a far more profound level, and it's music is packed with significance and meaning, but not significance and meaning that you can ex- explain in language. You know, it, it, music is a it's, it's a language of pure information. You know, mm-hmm. and and it is and it it's magic in as much as when you hear a piece of music, it's then it's with you and it's changed you. You know, you are in some way changed by which is why you'll hear a piece of music f- that you hadn't heard from years and you'll be instantly back into it wherever you were at that point it, it seems to sort of hit you on a deeper level and, and it's like say, yeah it's it's full of significance and meaning mm-hmm. but but if people say well, well what is the meaning you know what you can't explain it, but I, I know it has a meaning i know it has an importance and i know it's sort of got something to do with all the big kind of you know you know the, the young the, consciousness 
and the sort of and the universe the cogs of the universe and what goes on after we die and where we've come from and all the big psychedelic questions i know they're all i know music is it's to do with that and it's enough to know that sort of by serving that i am serving something important and cosmic and high high you know and you, you just sort of you owe it to yourself yeah you owe it to, to, to try and to be drawn towards where that funny charge of magic is and whether or not you're there or whether even anyone agrees with you, but you, you sort of know. Yeah, so you mentioned that it, it was only a few years ago that you um, started having this experience of uh, improvisation giving you that insight. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, if, but if, if, if you think about it, just the, just the complexity of, of expression, I don't mean, ex you know, personal expression, but behavioral expression that happens in improvisation is like so much richer than anything you can pre-plan right yeah like this yeah. it's it's like it's like that that one gesture that you make on your instrument is far richer than the whole knife world catalog if you know what i mean like in, in a way right yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and i that's that's what i find fascinating and you know i was i was lucky when i um started going to uni and i was 20 maybe um i was part of a big improvising uh orchestra it was called the chaos orchestra which was mm. in bielefeld university and it was like the it was like life-changing experience like the 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 band leader right the he was um, already in his 60s back then and he was just incredible to teach me that music really is is uh, is really <laughs> You can't quantify it, right? You cannot. You cannot. There's no way to quantify it, and there's also no way to say this is good or this is bad or whatever. And then just opening yourself up to this pure, what I, you know, I, for lack of better word, I say gestural. It's like a gestural way. So when I when I play my instrument in a free improvisational context, I may, may not be thinking about which notes I'm playing or if there's if I'm producing a buzz on the instrument or, or not, or it, it just doesn't matter. It's just all about being in the moment. And, and just for me, it's just like moving my hands. Mm. Right? Or even like when I'm interacting with my laptop, which is sort of like a partner in these solo improvisations, then I'm trying to do the same thing there. Like I'm just, you know, reaching for the keys that I've programmed to do something. And then I push them and, and everything, everything is just, just like, completely removed from from this this idea of being a player of music or like this this whole this whole uh scene that really we don't need to talk about much but like of the player right and of jazz where jazz had be become something that was like really something intuitive and then has become something that now is being like learned and trying to be it's kind of like a recreation of something that was already there and and i find I find it interesting that for you as such an accomplished musician that you say it it took you uh, 45 years um, to be in a position where improvisation suddenly kind of like started to make sense to you. Yeah, well, well it, it, yeah, it was funny because I'd, I'd always, I'd always um, been in these kind of rehearsal intensive bands. And certainly with like the Monsoon Bassoon, we were, you know, we were, writing this you know really writing the hell out of this uh, the, all these funny interlocking parts and and whatever but we'd always re we'd always improvise in rehearsal we always you know when we turned up we you know we spend the first you know it's a sort of smoke a joint and then spend the first kind of like um 15 20 minutes just improvising between the the five you know five players um and almost always sounded brilliant yeah, you know, it's always really exciting. These 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 pieces that have sways, man, and someone will come up with a review. You, you just really, really good. But we never really. Do you know what? Here's the thing: we never really thought about ever doing anything with that, mm -hmm. because I suppose in my mind, thinking about it now, why didn't we? And I tell you why: because I think in my mind, I had thought that improvising, like proper proper improvisers were people like Fred Frith or, you know, sort of uh, Derek Bailey or, you know, John Zorn. And that what we were doing, which was stuff that was, you know, sounded like our band, but maybe a lot more 
mm-hmm. sort of lot. Like, and we would still be doing all the different things of playing different meters, all the like a much more sort of like r- f- flailing version of our band and instrumental. I suppose I thought that that was just probably just jamming or, or jamming yeah. rock. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think having these kind of like well like having people like Frith and you know the, the, that kind of crowd. It made me think of improvising as being this quite sort of austere, serious thing, and I I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed going to these gigs, you know. I, I would always go and you know go to these sort of gigs, um, but I felt like maybe there was, I I wasn't good enough to be in that world or or something. And I I think it took joining Guapo, where we would have, all right, his you, you would have a sort of. In, cause cardiacs as well was obviously incredibly incredibly rehearsal intensive yeah. and just completely composed it was in guapo you'd have a point where this you'd have a composed section and then you'd have another thing but in in the mean in the interim we'll we'll work around this chord pattern and this sort of rhythm but then you can go off on one and i started that's when i started to sort of play the pedals a bit more get more into like ebo and delay and making loops and all that kind of just really just start playing the, and then the same thing with gong as well in gong there, there were yeah. This takes okay. When we get to this point, it could last between two or twelve, thirteen minutes, depending on whether we're getting a, something cool going. But even then, it's sort of we may be around. Okay, well, this is sort of around A major. This one, and you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes it would go off. It would it would go off into somewhere more kind of like harmonically complex, and you change key and get bitonal and stuff. So the gong was a was kind of cool with that, but with the Utopia Strong was where it was just right from the ground in. We just, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll agree on a key sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it will often just be straight in, and then and so it may take sometimes two or three minutes for the the shape to appear of yeah. what this piece is, and then and then once it once it appears and we sort of we've harnessed this new strange sort of thing that's appeared <laughs> we realize that you know you're you're because you're all realizing i mean this is i'm coming you're, you're hearing it for the first time yourself so you're all just coming to terms with it as with the audience except the difference is, is that you're able to you're able to affect its outcome somehow yeah, I, sometimes I, it's very precious and you don't really want to do much to it and uh, yeah. I, I, so that's I, really exciting i spoke with sid smith last week also oh, for the podcast, it. and and he mentioned that his last gig was the Utopia Strong uh, oh, yes. before COVID, and and he said it was absolutely fabulous, and he was like he said like the room was packed, and there was this moment where he felt like there was like this I can't can't remember his exact words there was this unity and community and this feeling like everybody was involved in this creation and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I I find it funny that um, this very um, uh, I would say tribal and ritualistic way of making music, like especially with electronics, right, is 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 really such a it's such a uh, that's that's the music of our times. I find yeah, yeah, it really yeah. is the music of our times, and it's still rare. I mean, it's not rare. A lot of people do it, but it has not really found its way. And I don't want to say mainstream because that's not what I mean. But it hasn't really found even like a small percentage of all the people who would be really enjoying it. Like yeah, I, yeah. because I, I I know there are a lot of people who who would really need this therapeutic music, this this uh, uh, ecstasy and trance and and yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, kind of like the beautiful void, which uh, like you know and yeah. This is something. This is something I had not thought about before, but you've you've hit on something here, and it, it's just got me thinking that, especially now, you know, talking back about what we used to, what I used to. I feel like in the nineties, in my twenties, I, I feel like although there was obviously, you know, there were there was a very pretty element in the in the writing, or whatever. I, I was feeling like. The, the music had to be sort of confrontational in some way. It had to be, I was feeling like the monsoon bassoon, although it was like, you know, it, it was quite confrontational. And I think that now I, I wanted, I, and, and it, was, it was always generous music, but I think like you, this is, there's something about now wanting to do something. I mean, it's look, we're 30 years on now, whatever, 20, 20 years on, things are different. I don't want to be just, I sort of don't want to be doing what I was doing when I was 25. And I think, 
yeah, making this music that, that that feels whatever it is that we're sort of going towards. Maybe I'm just finding f finding this new way of uh, of operating. But particularly with electronics, what I love about working with a with those guys with both with modular synth is there's such a kind of element of kind of chaos as to what you get. You're not entirely in control. Um, I, I don't think of of what comes out of that thing. Mm -hmm. But what comes out of it is. But but on the other hand, some people make stuff that sounds really boring that comes out of it. And yeah. <laughs> I seem to always make stuff that sounds really, really exciting. Yeah. And I can always hear, uh, it, it's this lovely, lo lo beautiful music, but I can always hear, or generally always hear where where my part is in that. I hear this thing that's getting generated. I go, All right, I know, I know how to, I know how to make this thing that sort of snakes through that, that whatever it is they do. But it's, it's, I mean, I know they're becoming really popular now, the modular synth, but I think you're right. It's now of its... It's very of its time, and it's a it's a lovely thing to play with because I, and I, to play with as in to perform with because I'd never ever necessarily would have thought with playing with the modular synth player, mm -hmm. and then just these friends, it's Steve and Mike did this thing, and let's just, just get together and have a see what happens, and yeah, it's 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 wonderful. I had a an wonderful insight the other day talking with a student. Um, he he said to me that he's interested in modular synthesis, and and um, then I said something that just <laughs> appeared out of out of the out of the blue. I said like, you know, that modular is not big. It, it's not called modular synth because it's about the modules of the synth. It's because it's about modulation. And really, that's that's it was so true. I mean, I said it just like uh, intuitively, but yeah. really, and, and 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 this is where we come back to this idea: like, what really, what what is music? What is music? Um, like I said, that music is the the material uh, of the world, or something like that. I said that earlier, and that's exactly what's happening there. If you take like one sound and it's being modulated by all sorts of different sources and and they are kind of like it's like there's cross feedback going on between these these you know these patch cables and you don't really know what's going to happen if you just just move the you know you just touch the knob and like wow and it explodes or you know and, and incredible music yeah. yeah yeah and this this just this this idea that modulation really is the interaction and the, you know i'm gonna get philosophical here again like modulation is the interaction with the world that's like needed at the moment right and when i when i say modulation modulation can be taking somebody's hand right or like you you modulate the you know the touch the feel of the of the hand like like i i you know i don't a hug or um or a beautiful word, or even even a nasty word. You know, everything is kind of like modulating the world and keeping the world going. And 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 I think if like with 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 this kind of improvised music that you mentioned, um, and especially with modular synthesis, you have a chance to really like recreate. You can recreate a whole world within within the space of the of the group that's performing and yeah and yeah. and and that's that's also maybe why why i said that it's sort of like the music of our times and that i'm surprised that that there are not many people that kind of like uh give into that kind of drug if we want to go that way yeah so but but speaking of that so you you mentioned lsd uh, before mm -hmm. so um what kind of role would you say um does that experience or those experiences um, play in your life and in your understanding of arts of the arts? For for me, massive. You know, re really, really massive. It was. It came. It came just at the right point. Um, and it seems to. It seems to bring together lots of threads that are, that, that seem perhaps unconnected. I mean, most importantly, music where I'd had, you know, I had this feeling about, I, I knew all I wanted to do was music, and to be a musician. And I knew that it was, you know, I, I was completely drawn to it and it seemed to be more important than anything else. And then I'd sort of always been interested in, sort of even even since, um, you know, to, to, I, I don't know, I'm going to talk about my own life. I was interested in, you know, I used to read a comic called 2000 AD and I particularly that's where I got on board with Alan Moore, the writer, mm -hmm. who was also very interested in things like the sort of physics of time and the idea of time not really existing. I mean, I know he didn't 
a regional, you know, that, that just you wrote these stories. I mean, this particular story, uh, Halo Jones, book three, in which I mean, it just absolutely captivated me, in which there's this battle scene on a planet in which the gravity is so heavy that it changes time. And so when the soldiers are out fighting, they they may think they're experiencing like 10, 15 minutes of combat. But to the, the inside place where there's the, the gravity is normal, that these guys have been out for like three or four months. Mm -hmm. So someone who just appears to have died, they watch their comrade die. Back there, they've already mourned them and, and, and they got over it by the time they come back in. So it's these kind of psychedelic concepts and mm -hmm. just the nature of existence. I'd always been... I'm, I'm, obsessed with death since i was seven I was sort of trying to find you know i wanted to wanted to believe in god but i couldn't really believe in god it just didn't seem to hold any truth or certainly not the way it was being you know kind of not the way it was being sold i always liked the idea of other dimensions all these things and then when i took acid it was as if everything just kind of connected oh the music the whole thing about there being no such thing as time. Ah, oh, the kind of the, the thing about there being other dimensions beyond this. It just all came together. And I saw music for a part of all of that and then realized, uh, you know, oh, yeah, this is what I've got to do. This, this is, oh, now I know, now I know what the point of me, now I know what the point of me getting into all those things were to, to bring it together and to sort of serve this, serve this master of this funny music. And also with listening to, for me, listening to that that kind of, you know, that real, well, you know, sort of like the, the, all that kind of, um, the, you know, that kind of, you know, King Crimson sort of thing like those, and then LSD and then those funny cardiac chords and it just sort of just kind of reprogrammed me and, and made me, it made me into kind of, um, you know, made j just gave me a purpose, gave me a kind of like a cos cosmic purpose. You never, you didn't talk too much about it because people think you're an asshole, or you just think, you know, mm -hmm. but you, yeah. you just, you know, for want of a better, we're not exactly a shaman, but well, maybe it's the, the idea of channeling something from that other dimension into this one. And go, well, that's as long as I'm doing that, as long as I'm serving that purpose of trying to access that other other world and bring it into this one, then this seems to be the right thing to be doing. So LSD was just, I mean, back then, I haven't taken it for years, you know, but back then it was sort of, um, you know, it did quite regularly and just wanted to, I used to write songs. Me and Dan would just write music on this and it just, really, again, it really just, just sort of injected total meaning into everything. It just absolute, every little piece of music, every bar, everything would just be, just really see the meaning of it kind of thing. So it, it, it gave me a kind of, or already, already my understanding of music on on some abstract level, it, it it kind of gave me more clarity with it, I suppose. Yeah, incredible. I mean, I I can't I can't uh, contribute because I didn't have any such experience. So, um, yeah. so and that, but that's why I'm interesting in hearing what you what you have to say. And uh, and I, for me, it's it's difficult to imagine how you would function um, as a musician when you are high you know I, I have no idea how that interaction how your awareness how your attention would even uh, make that i have no idea tell me about it like well i, I couldn't i couldn't perform you'd, you'd hear these stories of like oh hawkwind and you know lemmy played on acid and i mm. hear this i've never i've never done that but in terms mm. of for writing for, in terms of writing and having the ideas it was just you're, you're wide open i think you're just you're wide open to these ideas. I found that, you know, problem problem solving was extremely easy uh, on acid. Things that okay. things where may take you. I don't know. For instance, you might have you might have a piece of music and something happens that that you kind of that you like this thing that happens, but it's not right for the song, mm -hmm. and it might take you hours or days or weeks because you're sort of married to this particular thing and you think, oh no but I like you know as soon as you take it out you know the song's got so much better <laughs> the piece has got better mm -hmm. and you know that sort of stuff sort of instantly with 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 so like, no this this bit's bogus it gives you it's just like it gives you it, it gives you three weeks jump ahead of yourself on realizing what's working and what's bogus and what isn't and like having a riff you just realize no that's that's the problem it might sometimes you, you might come up with a riff and you know that there's 
there's a certain chord in it or a certain note that is a problem, but you you haven't quite solved the problem of what that what that note is, mm-hmm. why that note is wrong. Mm-hmm. You haven't mm-hmm. quite solved that. Maybe you don't first realise it. It takes playing this tune for two or three hours to realise why that note is a problem. But you realise really quickly with when you're high, I think. Interesting. Uh, but no. but not not to not not as a performing thing. I think I've never. That's never. I've just never never sort of. I've always separated the two worlds. And and is was your memory kind of like intact like after the uh, after the high i mean was the writing session or did you guys have to record what you did or no no i mean the memory is fine that the hardest thing of 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 psychedelics and and again this is why i think psychedelics and music are absolutely married for me is that the experience and, and I, I keep coming back to this the experience you, you are given such a big understanding of everything really but you you can't clothe this in language mm-hmm. it's like an understanding of, this goes back to the story what i was talking about earlier being really interested in dreams as well and all of that sort of coming together it's the same way that you you know you may experience something in that in that funny sort of no man's land between being awake and being asleep do you ever have this thing where you will just have an absolute moment of clarity about the nature of existence you ever mm-hmm. get this? Yeah. But you, you, but then as soon as you've you've gone into the the waking state, it, it it's like sand. It's gone. You've got to. You can feel the stink of it. You can, <laughs> I, I, I kind of I kind of knew what it was all about. Then I had one second where it was just like the face of God just goes ah. And I, I understand everything. I understand. Boom, it's gone. And it's and the same with music. When when you when you're listening to it, sometimes you. you you know exactly what this thing is describing, but you couldn't possibly put it into words, and that's the the, the frustrating thing with sort of with with LSD. But I, I could bring the music back. I found that I couldn't I couldn't really work, and that's why people on acid will talk about oh wow man a god and this and the because we don't really have the language to describe that terrain. It's mm-hmm. a, it's a funny terrain that exists, but we don't really have the language to describe it. But music seems to be a better language to to describe it. You know, so I can go. Oh, what was that experience like? Well, it was sort of like this. <laughs> play, play, play a sort of circular riff. Go, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I was at. With, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. Like you know, as we said, like music has the foundation of everything. So, right? Yeah, so, I think it is. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I mean, I was just thinking, my my daughter, she took her first steps today. I just thought my daughter took her first acid. <laughs> exactly. How old is she? Oh, wow. And she's uh, 50, 15 months. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. How old is your daughter? She is now 11 and, um, ele- yeah, 11. I was going to say 11 and a half, not quite. Hmm. Wow, first steps. I remember I was away I was away playing a guitar with a band called Chrome Hoof when hmm. my daughter took uh, her first steps. And that's when I thought, I don't, I don't think I can do this band uh, anymore. Because yeah, because missing out missing out on that because it wasn't it, it was you know it was a friend's band it was really good fun and everything but was was uh, that with Emmett was that with Emmett that was Emmett and Chloe yep that's right mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. okay but yeah God that's it's amazing I've just I, I don't know I was so glad to get a daughter you know I could, I grew up around boys so I always wanted to always wanted a daughter yeah you know I I thought I that I didn't have an opinion or don't have an opinion but it's ideal for me to have a daughter. It's just, it's just incredible. It's like really what I needed. <laughs> it's amazing. What, what I love about it, talking about psychedelic experiences, mm. what I love about it is it, it, it's just how profoundly conscious, consciousness change, conscience, conscience changing, mm-hmm. becoming a parent is. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, it changed me. Well, it, I tell you what, talk about getting serious about music. It was when my daughter was born that I really, really thought, okay, I've, I've got to, I mean, I'd always done it, but I really had to do it properly. Mm-hmm. And I've been f- far more prolific since since that, because I just thought, I don't want her to grow up and think I'm a loser. You know, I want to, I, I really <laughs> feel like I really want her to grow mm-hmm. up and see that her dad's putting some good in the world kind of thing. Yeah, it make, makes sense. I mean, you know, for me, it, it's been super challenging, challenging this year. Like, uh, you know, like she was born on 1st of uh, October, 
and uh, then I, I, I yeah, <laughs> I went, I went on, I went on tour. Um, yeah, but went on went on tour with Devin and returned. Oh, right. And after that, um, uh, so basically, I have not been away. So it was just incredible to be at home at the same time, not being able to uh, to to do my job, right? And not not having that that income source was super challenging. So I kind of like, even though I was already forced, let's say, to reinvent reinvent myself because. I had become a father so then like the next step was like okay i can't even do my job anymore so i have to reinvent myself there as well yeah. and i have to say that's that was maybe the biggest challenge of this year like in all the, like all the tiredness and like this this uh you know <laughs> i really believe that at least for me having that baby you know or that baby coming into life it it was basically I was giving half of my life's energy to her in that moment that she was born. Yeah. Uh, and it was so profound because like it was that that night uh, that night sleep after her birth. She was born at 9 at uh, 9 at night. Um was like the first time in my life that I was tired. And I'm not joking here. You know you know it was tiredness. It was, but, but yeah, but it was not, but it was not because it was a hard day or anything. Yeah. I mean, it, it was exciting and stuff, but, but it was like just the fact that there is this being now. And it was as if, as if in that moment I had already given her, her a lot of myself, like passed it on to her somehow, just the fact that she yeah. came into existence and and that was just the the most incredible experience and it's it's still ongoing like where i feel that that i have much less uh energy available to myself which on a practical level is also true but i mean on a spiritual level and yeah. and and uh, i can really i can see what you were saying that this this process of reinvention uh, or reinventing yourself having had a bit or you know having uh the responsibility for a child let's say mm. is really is really the moment where things change Devin said exactly the same to me he said like when he had his boy that was the moment that he became serious about being a musician and uh oh wow okay yeah same for him i know yeah. I, I know some people that, that that's the moment they give up uh but that that was never really you know <laughs> but yeah but you know or they just oh i mean you know but Here's the thing um, that you re you really hit on, um, that something about giving giving a part of yourself is that as uh, you know as a musician I spend my my whole life completely wrapped up in myself you know just, or, or my work whatever but all I'm really thinking about most of the time is just thinking about whatever it is I'm doing and also I've been through the app just the pure grace of the grace of having been born at a certain time at a certain place. <laughs> Um, and a, a period in history where I was able to kind of leave school and just leave home and do what I wanted, just what I wanted, as, as long as I didn't want money. I kind of, and so I've really been living in this little bubble of just being obsessed with my work and all that kind of thing. And then to, in that instant of becoming a parent, you, for the first time, meet someone that is more important than you. Mm -hmm. you think, All right, I'll die. If I, if I, if it has to come down to her living or me living, kill me now. You know, mm -hmm. and no question. You don't, you don't give it any, any thought. Mm -hmm. And then that is that. And so you've, you, boy, oh boy, does that change you without noticing? It's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not that most. You know, I'm not the most important person. But it's not a struggle because all it does, it, it's like it just flips. It, it flips the conscious. It, it, the switch just goes, and you're not that. You still have the same memories. Mm -hmm. Even your memories change, yes. because then you've you've seen everything from this single camera, and you've re remembered all these sort of like, um, you know, all these altercations I had with my parents, and then, and which I've been play you you play out in your mind all your life about, and then they did this, and and then you realise the the other camera switches on the other <laughs> bank, and you realise, oh, I was a real asshole, wasn't I? I was a real <laughs> asshole to them then. I was, I thought it was me, and you. And you think you realize what your parents, it, it makes you think you're, I mean, it, it really, my relationship, with my parents got so much better when I became a parent myself, because I realized, no, 
I was the asshole. Mm -hmm. I got it all wrong. It wasn't yeah. them. It was me. You know, and that was and it. But it took it took having a child for me to realise that I was the asshole. I was so wrapped up in myself. <laughs> Yes, so the metaphor I came up with, because um, as I said, I was touring with Devin then, and and he asked me, so Marcus, what is, is it like for you? And I said to him, I said, it's as if a light is shining on the dark side of the moon now. Yeah. It was like through, as you're saying, it was that, ex, that extra camera angle, like seeing life through her eyes yeah. and, and, and realizing like, and, and just, just practically even like, like, what do I remember from my childhood? Like maybe I, I can't, I, I have to admit, I can't remember much at all. Like even like when I was in high school, I can't, at least five years that I can't remember what I did there <laughs> anyway but just like maybe like when you're starting to go to to school right you have like some memories and but now I see that this person like she's already there in that body like from the from the very beginning and and so it was the same for me so I was there already the first six years seven years of my life but I have no I have no memory of that and what I mean by that, I even it even even seems that there is no, and this is that there is no spiritual memory of that. But that's not true. I think we kind of like through our emotions that we still experience as grown-ups, we kind of like always reconnect to that to that child in us that was unconscious, let's say, right? Yeah. And and. And I find that so incredible to see that now there's this part of part of me growing up where I can experience or re-experience, in a way, the process of becoming, of, 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 of growing up and becoming conscious. And that kind of like fills in a gap in my memory, I feel like it's, it's almost like I'm replacing um, something that I kind of can't remember with actual events that are happening right now yeah that's a, that that is that's exactly what it is and I, because i i sort of felt like i didn't really feel like i came online till i was seven and i from from seven onwards certainly from eight onwards when i first heard stray cats <laughs> i can remember that, that because that was like their life and also i can look on well what was that you know well i could see from what, what from what year albums were released what i was i remember what i was doing that year oh, i remember i bought i bought number of the beast then and i did this but before that before seven you got one you know you got any extreme memories i remember what a door looked like in this house in york oh i remember what this carpet looked like oh, i remember getting told off by a teacher and the smell of her trousers when she spank me all the weird things like that but you don't remember you have little extreme memories but through through watching this sort of child grow up you you re you do completely reconnect with what you were like at that age and, and you go back through it again and the weird thing is i i've turned into my dad you know that was the weird thing i never thought but you you turn into your dad i mm -hmm. say the same things that my dad would say that i haven't thought about in years you know they, they just sort of come out it's really it's a it's strange man <laughs> Well, fortunately, I have not experienced that yet. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, good luck with that it's... one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a mixed bag. When you, you realise you've turned into your dad, I've got to say, it's not enough. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. yeah, man. So it's it's wonderful to be talking with you. Um, I, you know, I was I was planning um, to to play with you on the cruise ship again. Uh, Remember. That I, yeah. I contacted you, yeah. and yeah. Um, that would have been fantastic. Yeah, I was going to suggest it, suggest we do fracture. You know, but, uh, <laughs> no, I tell you what, I can, could never do the. Um, I did. We, so here's here's the thing. Getting back to fracture. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember get, you know, for me that was the as I said before that was just seemed to be the center of the the center of the King Crimson bullseye. Just mm -hmm. that song. I it was song that piece whatever. Mm -hmm. that, that was was everything I was looking for. Um, uh, and so remember me and my friend Richard Larkham and Dan Chudley sort of worked it out and I we loved this idea that we had this idea that wouldn't it be funny that the, uh, this idea that in an alternate world that Fracture was just this standard tune like Smoke on the Water that was the one that you know everybody's first tune and so when you'd say to people 
oh, do you play guitar? No, nah, not really. I mean, I can play Fracture, but no, no, no not, not really. No, not the, <laughs> the idea that just the entry level, I'll get, but the thing is I could never play, I'm sure you can, but I could never get there. I used to have to sort of tap it to do it, but Dan, mm-hmm. Dan um, in our band, he could, he could kind of do it, but it's... That was where the, that was where the frip kind of thing I fell off. I just in, that insane picking at that speed. Yeah, my my friend Anthony has just written a, a book about his experience learning that piece. Oh, really? Really? Like yeah, it, it's the kind of thing you could write a book about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's incredible, right? It's like this this you could say like the 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 elements used are sort of as simple or as complex as any other music. But the way the the the, uh, I think it comes. It really comes from a place of practicing. Yeah, and that is that is kind of like unique in nowadays world, because like when you know what I what I mean, like like yeah, you, like like you say, like you're a composer. You have these parts in your head, and you can just like sing them, and like but. But like for, for, for Fripp, uh, he probably didn't have the piece in his head, but he had yeah. this idea to anchor one finger and move the other two fingers, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it comes from this idea of an exercise that then turns into a piece of music. And, and that's why it's, it becomes almost like an unbreakable lock that yeah, where, yeah, yeah. Where, it's, where, it's, where it's that one person who's written it and maybe a few people who kind of like learned the process of composing that piece, meaning like, how do I think about writing exercises? How do I think about holding the pick? And like these things that have nothing to do with music really, but you kind of like have to, like like you and Tim Smith's music, like you you heard it and you already knew what the vibe was about. Yeah, so but yeah. with Fracture, it's not learning, hearing the music and knowing what it's about. No, it's not about the music. It's about an approach to life or an approach to practicing. And yeah. that's why it's an unbreakable lock for most that. people. Unbreakable lock, yeah. Yeah, it's... But it's it's, <laughs> it's funny that you, you say it's sexual, because I, I, I suppose that the thing with, with the kind of frip side of things, you know, the frip side of things is that a lot of his, a lot of the, the kind of instrument stuff, it, it, it's these patterns, isn't it? It's a, a, a lot of it is patterns sort of mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, th- for me, for me, the, the the side to King Crimson I was really drawn towards, or, or really kind of resonated me with me, were that were was that side of things, and sort of like sort of talking drum and you know larks tongues and aspic and mm-hmm. and you know for instance like the the middle bit of um, Starless, uh, the middle bit of Starless, but I, I was never really especially liked you know the the songs that bookend the, the mm-hmm. actual song part of Crimson. For mm-hmm. instance, you know, like I love the, you know, bad and one more, you know, one more red night, but that, that's lovely. But then when we get into da, 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 I, I don't need that tune, you know, at all, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, and it's so, so it's Crimson's a strange old band because absolutely, you know, the, the, the angular architecture is just buzzes with this mad, strange, radiant magnificence. But the, they're like a band of two bands with the easy money. I just, it's, it's not for me at all, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Whereas with a band where, with a band band, I suppose, which is why it's funny that they get put in the, they're, they're lumped in the same category as, say, something like Yes, which was just, it's all songs. Yeah. To me, like Yes was like songs. It wasn't, and it wasn't, I mean, obviously I love the drumming and stuff in Crimson, but really Crimson for me was about that kind of, that, that, that frip thing and I love that um that under heavy manners and all that those those no what was it called um the, what, the, there's that that one that's called um not cognitive co- yeah. That one? yeah that's uh, that's the league of gentlemen League of gentlemen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's one of, yeah. for me one of my favorite frip things because it's yeah. just it's for me as well for me as well yeah that's that's uh, but it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So groovy, and that, that just that that's the yeah, that's really what I was about. It, and for, for me, really, that record is his best writing. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. It's, yeah. And 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 people underestimate the uh, 
uh, the the guitar parts. I think like that that playing on that record is off the charts. It's like the the the, the power like you have to have in your hands to play that kind of music. And like like with with the bands within the patterns, you know, and the fast things, and and uh, anyway, like it's isn't it interesting? Like like Fripp, Robert, you know, being being uh, <laughs> kind of like a small person, right? Yeah. Like I, I mean, like physically, uh, yeah, yeah. And 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 having this immense power and this influence really on 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 the rock guitar, um, mm. it's. I, I still I think that we still really don't know um, what kind of influence he did have. Let's say, like yeah, yeah. I, I think he he still can play and he still does play and um, so yeah yeah. But I'm I'm totally with you when it comes to like the parts of the songs that I like and that I don't like and yeah, it's yeah. yeah. But but then I not to be uncharitable, but I just, no 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 I just I just learned I just learned to um, and it's the same it's the same with Mike Oldfield, where I yeah. where I just what I did is I became so interested in his in his path, in his yeah. in his artistic path that I still listen to everything he does, and 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 I I I, I tried to, let's say I tried to make sense of it. Uh, looking at it from the outside, like uh, as if I'm, I'm kind of like experiencing him writing an autobiography in music. Yeah. Right. So that's that's sort of the idea, and that's the yeah. same approach I, I I take to listening to Crimson albums, where I basic you're basically you can hear the struggle, you can hear the different influences, you can hear that somebody there there has given in to actually allowing the verse of one yeah. more red nightmare you know that's kind of like what yeah, I, yeah, yeah. and it may not actually be true that it was that way but that's kind of like the story that the that the story that the songs tell or the the pieces yeah. tell yeah. right so the it's and and that's why i can appreciate um all of those albums and and i can kind of like see the good in everything like yeah, yeah. you know so it, it's not a deal breaker for me let's say Right. Yeah, 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 and yeah, and it's uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, the most interesting um, aspect of having this conversation with you for me is now, like, if we think about our, the people who listen to our music, like, I would really, I would love to know what they really think or what they really experience or or which parts they like and which parts yeah. they don't like. I I want I want to know. Nobody does that. No, I mean, just, yeah, yeah. If only you shut his mouth and let you know. <laughs> yeah, I I, I want to know what what my one more red nightmare intro riff is and also yeah. what the first verse is. Like that's I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's what that's all. What that's what we're looking for. Yeah. The, the, to to sort of to, to hear it objectively kind of thing yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, it's nice to hear you it's nice to hear you bring up Mike Oldfield I was really really loved those um you know there was a I love his lead guitar playing as well but I think mm -hmm. the incantations and Omidorn especially and yes. Hurgis Ridge is really like vibey records they're really into them you know he's he said that it was actually his his one LSD experience that he had was actually uh, put him off of uh, of the idea of ever ever having an experience like that again yeah, interestingly yeah. enough he had he had a bad trip i think <laughs> yeah 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 well no, it's, it's not for everyone um yeah. he said that the solo at the end of um the solo at the end i've got an interview but he says the solo at the end of side one of Omadorn was mm -hmm. him being him being reborn out of his mother kind of thing it was it, it, it was it, about yeah. yeah his mother had just died right oh right okay. yeah 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 and yeah you can i mean you can you can kind of hear that you know it's, it's incredible it was just out of this world you know yeah and you know he did he did an album called return to Amadon, which you could say oh yeah crazy like he does like you know like a sequel but it's not really a sequel and uh he had just lost a son who who died who died uh, from a heart attack at 34 or something like or something crazy and and it's it's I, I have the impression like when I listen to that album, I hear that. I hear that 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 lullaby that he probably played to him in the early 80s, right? And you have that that kind of uh, it's that's what I mean when I say that I listen to his music as sort of 
like a, like an example. You know, I, I, it's, it's, I was lucky to be, you know, to, to uh, learn about his music early on, like in 1980 or something. And, and so I, I think it's a privilege to be able to follow an artist, even if you can't really understand why, you know, why certain, why certain decisions are being made. But yeah, I, I, I find it, I find it fascinating. I think that's, that's also um, why I still go to Crimson shows, you know, yeah, yeah. like, and I think it's that kind of that kind of dedication to to uh, to um, wanting to understand what it means to be an artist, um, what it what it means to be creative, and um, and I I was always kind of like looking up to um, certain role models. Not that I wanted to repeat what they have done, but maybe to learn from their mistakes, even. Yeah. 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 No, I I, I agree. Well, just just quickly, just to go on something. Something. But... Were you taught by Fripp? Was that the... Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. When when was that? Between ninety one and ninety seven, or ninety eight, actually ninety eight. So it was seven seven years. And how regularly was was this? I I can't remember really. I probably only had a handful of uh, meetings with him in person, and um, and maybe only three or so private meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was. For me, the relationship with him was was incredible as like a teacher, student or instructor, blah, 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 relationship. It was incredible. Like the um, I've told this story before, but I'm going to repeat it. Like my very first meeting with him was the night before the course started. That was in 91 in Switzerland that he did a guitar craft course. And yeah, yeah. and and uh, it was the evening before and I was in what it was in a, in an old castle <laughs> and I was walking yeah. through a corridor and Robert uh, walked uh, there, you know, was there walking and he had his uh, white nightgown on. And, and I asked him, oh, Robert, what are you doing here? And he said to me, Marcus, I'm going for, well, he didn't say Marcus, he didn't know my name then, but he said, I'm going for a piss. So that was really the very first thing he said to me. And, and somehow that has been, at least as I'm concerned, like the foundation of the way we talk with each other, right? So, 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 <laughs> so, so I, I felt really, really, um, in a way, I feel comfortable with him, but then, like the way that everybody else was interacting with him, was kind of like uh, strange because, like, for a lot of people, he was like the guru and 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 like like really uh, an, a person of authority, let's say. And he was a person of authority for me as well when it came to his knowledge, right? And his, um, but but there was like this for me. It was wonderful because, like, everything he said, I kind of like took it so seriously in the in the sense that i had a look at it and i i I looked i you know i saw how does this fit in with my life how can i make this work what can i take from his teaching and uh, teachings and kind of integrate that into my life and you know that was the also the time in my life when i first discovered the the chapman stick which i started uh working with when i was uh, uh 19 or 20 in uh, in 92 and um and it was just incredibly uh, important and like everything kind of fit like so there was the chapman stick there was no nobody really wanted to tell me how to play it like people wanted to tell me what to play in it but nobody wanted to tell me how to play it so and frip was all about how to play and and so it it fit and fit together perfectly and and it was just great it was great. I was also like the, uh, I think the only person back then who was allowed to actually take part in a in an official guitar craft course with an instrument that's not a guitar. Oh right, okay. And so that um, was your first the first course you came with the Chapman stick, kind of thing. No, no, on the first course I was was still with a, 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 a an acoustic guitar, but okay. you, but later, but later on. Did you read the Eric Tam book? Uh, I did. Um, I did. Yes. Yeah, because was it like was it like he describes in that? I can't remember the details, but yeah, a little bit. But Eric Tam describes the uh, mid '80s uh, experience, and and really, Guitar Crowd has changed um, regularly. Um, right, okay. Yeah, but but like for me, it was just great. Like he gave me exercises um, where sometimes I, 
you know, I, re I remember that I had like finally kind of mastered an exercise and I was looking back and like, when did Robert actually tell me about this exercise? And I look, oh, 12 years ago. Right. Oh, dude. So, so that it was that kind of content he gave me to work with, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so that's why the few meetings we had uh, were incredibly instructive and just so important. And somehow, um, I kind of like came into this position where I felt like I have some sort of understanding of how the music works that he wrote, which I don't I mean that, you know, I, I it, it may not be true at all. But it's just that, at least as a bit little bit of confidence that when I go on stage and play Lux Tongues 2, that yeah. has that power that I, at yeah. I felt when I was listening to that music. And 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 then there was this this really uh, kind of awkward uh, grouping which was called the Crimson Project, which was uh, Adrian Belus oh, yeah. trio and Stickman, and we played the '80s uh, material together, right? Or some of the '80s material and some of the '90s material, and and I had to play Robert's part, and it was was kind of awkward to me. And what I what I did is I just tried to play. I tried not to play the same notes, but I tried to do play a part that sounded as if it is the same right like so so i didn't yeah. i didn't want to try to copy what he did and uh yeah and it was yeah i was i mean he was he was really really important like there was um, a meeting i had with him in 2006 in portugal at a festival the guvea festival which maybe you know oh, you're supposed to play it again like yeah exactly yeah, yeah yeah exactly and <laughs> And I had a meeting with him there, and he actually gave me the. I mean, he didn't. He didn't mean to, but he gave me the idea to actually start building my own guitars. Okay. So he have he's always been, it? huh? Have you have you have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been I've been to that for a long time, okay. um, but that was in 2006, and in 2007 I started I started building uh, the first prototype, and yeah. So you didn't know, yeah. The instruments I'm oh, playing, I those are I, I designed them, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, and it's far out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so he was. He was very, very important for me. And yeah, really, really nice guy. He's always been very nice to me. Yeah. I mean, he always, he always seemed, you know, extremely nice. I've never, I've, I've never really bought into this. Um, the sort of the, the no, I don't know if it's a myth, but the sort of the word around it. I mean, as far as I can tell, and this is this is changing the subject a bit, but. As far as I can tell, in this in this world of whatever you want to call it, the the funny music, I, I encounter so few people that are anything other you know at all difficult or I mean, everyone's really nice because you because you you you're driven by you 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 again going back to the I'm making it too cosmic you're you're serving a higher power you're serving a greater master mm -hmm. and I I just find you know musicians so easy to get on with I'm, I'm almost like because you can, because all I would, all I really ever want to do is talk about music and consciousness. <laughs> you know, anyway, really. you know, I think you're, I think you're right. But um, in a certain, on a certain level of success, let's say, or a certain um, um, moment in time in history, right? Things were a little yeah. bit different. Yes, so, of course. So, so I don't know. Like, if you, if you are, I don't know, John Anderson, or you know, like Steve Howe. They have kind of like they grew up in a different world where, yeah. um, even though I think that their in their initial intentions and even like their current intentions they are still true and 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 pure, but but having been kind of like brought into the world by the record labels who started yeah. kind of like abusing musicians, right, and. And I think that that really changes you. So that's why I, I think it's not just a myth that there can be people that are difficult to deal with, even no, though I, I, even though I agree, I agree with you that like uh, like uh, originally, you know, all we want to do is talk about music. Yeah. Right? But if it turns into some sort of a, uh, uh, anxiety, you know, if people get anxieties like talking with other people, not knowing. Like in the Oldfield book, I don't know if you've read it. Like there's a, no, I haven't. No. Like like he says, I don't have friends, I have lawyers. Oh uh, right, okay. And it's kind of sad. It's sad, and yeah. And I can I can see how that can be um, that can be true and that can be a problem. And but but you know, speaking of Fripp and Oldfield, you know, I once asked Robert Fripp uh, about Oldfield, and this was this was incredible. Like I, um, 
because I said to Robert that I heard that he's so difficult to approach and difficult person. And then Robert said to me, don't believe what people say. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, I, <laughs> same thing with him. It's when people have it, has this impression, I think he, does, he doesn't strike me as being the sort of per, person that people... You, you know, it also depends depends on the context, right? In a work context, like it may be something different, but in the personal context i don't know anyway i i hope that i'm i'm not too difficult a person no, i've never found you <laughs> i mean there's, that's that's part of it but i think that's part of the um certainly for for me part of the um the the, the, the way that the the reason to, you know to be not exactly the reason to be a musician but it, it certainly helps if you get on with people i think if you're a writer and you're only in your own, as I found out over the summer, being a writer, you're just in this world on your own and da 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 And I suppose it's the same if you're doing your own solo music and working on something. You're just living in that f fantasy world. But mm. by and large, you're as a musician, you're interacting with other people all the time. And it's not only the people you're in a band with, but if you're touring, you're interacting. Each day you're meeting maybe, well, before you even get to the meeting the audience afterwards. Mm -hmm. I always like to try and meet people afterwards, you know, but... You're meeting the the staff, the people that work at the venue. The, here's the this guy's <laughs> catering, whatever. So you you've kind of got to get on with people, you know. You yeah. have to, and uh, you've got to play nicely with others. You've got to, you know, you don't want to come back off a tour and that you were and ever be the reason that pe the tour wasn't enjoyable, you know. And I've, <laughs> yeah. I've been in I've been in situations with bands where people have have been that reason, and mm. you you, don't, you you can't you know you say, well, I can't be in uh, you know you, usually they're not people. You work in a band with, and with with being in a band, you've got to you always feel like you have to. Have, I feel like I have to have done one tour with people to really know what they're like because they might be amazing players and really good fun. But then, I've been in scenarios where you know, even on a two week tour of Europe, a member of the band is just completely unravelled, and afterwards, it's always, I can't ever do that again. You know, yes. well, I, I can't be on a tour with that person again. It was, it was horrible. You know, mm -hmm. so um, so what was the point? point i was making i'm just <laughs> don't, well, don't worry. to get on with people i think you have to yes. you have to you have to be able to get on you yeah. know with others otherwise it's a it's it's the wrong game to be in yeah. i think um and I, you I know just just meeting meeting people meeting the audience uh, meeting the listeners of your music is the yeah. most powerful thing and that's what I meant before when I was saying that the the music business was kind of abusing musicians, but because yeah. they sort of put the musicians on a pedestal, like a fake yeah, pedestal, yeah. and yeah. and there was this divide, right? And 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 I I I'm so grateful that that kind of divide has never existed for me, and I don't yeah. ever want it in my life. Um, yeah, even even the fact that I'm doing this with you now and it will be public and people can watch it is is kind of like part of this idea that I want I you know this this is what I had after shows like I could actually talk with people and yeah. I'm missing it I'm missing it so like talking with you and having somebody like somebody else listen to it um, is it's a beautiful thing. This is the extension of the conversation we had on the on the boat, right? I mean, this, that, that's what <laughs> yeah, <it is>. exactly. <laughs> Well, on that tip as well, about whether or not this was a sort of a conscious uh, choice. But for instance, for me, when I ended up, um, when, when I joined Cardiacs, or, or at least not even before, when I joined Cardiacs, when I became part of that circle, when I moved to London, it sort of became pals. Tim Tim was really into my band, Monsoon Bassoon, and we, we sort of became pals. I was working with Cardiacs. And I, I think this guy's a bona fide genius. Yeah, you know, thought Tim absolutely before i ever met him and he you know he treated everyone with, with so well and with so respect you you will never meet people who thought that knew that ever met tim smith and thought he was an asshole whether mm. they were people that were just working at a venue whatever he, he he was lovely to everyone you know he really treated people with respect and it's like well he's a genius he, you know, he's the guy that if he wanted to be a dick he could be because he's mm -hmm. a genius and, and he isn't a dick so mm -hmm. how how you know how dare you, you really make how dare anyone be a dick you know mm -hmm. he, he's the man and he's lovely so no, i've never bought into this kind of like the, the you know the the asshole at the front and all the make, making demands all that. i'm like you I've, it's never been it's never been you know i've wanted to get on with people i've never mm -hmm. I've never really had anything anything to hide i've never you know wanted worried about being cool or being detached there's nothing to hide i've always been pretty upfront. 
you know, about, uh, d d you know, and, and as honest as I, as I can be, you know. But, yeah, I don't think, I've, I mean, I wouldn't mention them anywhere, but I've, I've, I've met so few in, in this game, so, so few people where I really think, you know, certainly in the yeah. people who's, who are making music, I think is absolutely, it, you know, really, really important. I agree. It's incredible. Like, even, like, now, like, people I've met once on the road, like, 15 years ago, and I, sometimes I get an email and says, dude, I'm in town playing at Columbia Halle in Berlin. Do you, do you want to want to be on the guest list? Like stuff like that from musicians that I've met 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I find that it's just, just an incredible, beautiful kind of like gesture that, you know, you're being remembered by by your peers somehow, you know, and, and there's this, this network. I mean, that, that's something that's hardly ever talked about. I think like these friendships yeah. between yeah. people that you only meet at airports, right. Or backstage yeah, at festivals. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there, there are some, some uh, ideas for um, cool documentaries here, I think like, you know, but yeah. Hey man. Yeah, so I always, I always put musicians on the guest list, you know, if, if, if you know, if they're musicians, they're always on the guest list. You know, it, it's like the thing, you know, musicians don't pay, you know, and, I, and I'm always happy to take advantage as well of when I'm on the guest list. Because I think, you know, we're in this funny world. We, you know, we know what we're, we're, you know, we're in the army now. You know, we're not civilians. You know, it's like, That's true. So I, I, I treat musicians, I do, you know, which is, which is not to say I don't put civilians on the civilians. On the, <laughs> my friend of mine is a sound engineer, a guy called Patrick uh, Patch Hannon. And he first referred to non-musicians as civilians. It was on a gong <laughs> tour. I loved it. And it, 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 was, it was, you know, we were on, the, and uh, it was when we were on the Euro Tunnel. And he referred that, and I'd never heard it before. It was just so funny. It was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, civilians. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I started to actually um, pay, even though I'm on the guest list, depending on what kind of gig it is. Like, if, if I see there's only, yeah. like, 20 people there anyway, I, yeah. I feel bad. Not oh, paying yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're really demanding like this empty place. <laughs> demanding you get let in. For free. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you, man. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. I think we should we should stop here because we could go on for it was, it was over two hours. So. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> That's perfect. Marcus, I've really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I hope we can, um, I hope we have, are you are you on? The, if it ever happens again, the boat. Are you on the next one? Yeah, we're 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 booked already for the boat for the boat, so yeah, yeah. but that's going to be in uh, twenty two, I think, right? Yeah, I I really yeah. hope it's. If we do do something, we're gonna have a shitload of downtime of being nothing to be, to, to, to be uh, from what <laughs> yes. I remember. So, you know. yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, well, look, lots of love. Thank you. Lots so of love. Much. Say hi to your family, please. And, and yeah. you'd love to Jessica as well. Really, really good to talk to you, man. Yeah. Bye, my All friend. Right. Bye, Carlos. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye.